I was headed to shoot my Randy one second ago in the, in the thought that I would beat this out. But I think that to give, I mean, do, I'll try and do a little improvisation as we go. I think we can talk about a dance. You're going to do a Okay, so in his write up, and you're all part of what's encouraged to read about this, is that late and it's incredibly enlightening. He is the resident to watch the tour. And I said, okay, well, what's that about? And you may have noticed during your last couple of days, I didn't come into the workshops, sitting quietly at the back and taking it all in. And so this workshop this afternoon is that refraction, a refractive perspective of what went on in the last couple of days. I think take a look at what the crap is all about. And it seems to be very appropriately used words in this reference. I'll just read what the Wikipedia says about it. The rays of light are refracted by the material of the lens. So just to let you know where the lens is. Ready? So, without any further ado, because I know there are rain warnings and snow warnings, I'd like to introduce Benny W. Uh, and then talk about why it spoke to me. So 
So, some folks are like, you know, how do you want to do our and maybe like, how do you is the principal of the 10-yard learning center in America. And yesterday she was speaking um, with her colleagues about some business learning programs to specifically support students in Washington. And I walked through the session, and the moment that I observed were the moment about collaboration and teamwork. And Colleen was describing one of her colleagues. And she said that she said he asked questions which are really rich. The questions and that's helpful. Really rich questions and that's helpful. Again, Colleen was not talking about me at all. And I recognize that. However, I'm going to try in this talk today to rise to her standard and shape my comments around the asking questions that are rich and ideally helpful. So thank you for that thought. As I mentioned, as I was walking around, I had a group of folks who were helping me out, and curators, and I want to make sure we thank the very done all the various folks who are utilizing their feet and their notification and their online resources, and not only keeping track of various sessions, but also sharing that information online. And I did a lot of room on that was kind of the second step in trying to simplify a lot of my thoughts. Thank you for the observation, looking at the summary online. And, and by the way, these are tremendous open resources for folks. And, and I would highly recommend that if you have yet to go into certain session summaries, that perhaps you could attend in person. If you do so, then you perhaps download those or save them to your own Google Drive and reference these resources. Which is really quite wonderful. And I also relied upon some special material notes, some of which got sent to me even quite late last night. And again, I just want to thank everyone for your daily insight into the collective activity of everything that occurred here. And so, this is the community that has spent time together for the past three days. And here at the Sandy and Symposium, we've been quite a diverse group. And learned earlier today from Randy that this is an approximation of who's been in the rooms. About two thirds of folks from public institutions and a third of dependents. 50% of the attendees here in the past few days were from DC DL schools. And then amongst all of the attendees, 10% from Alberta, 5% from Saskatchewan, another 5 and 5% from Quebec. And almost a majority of folks working in the primary and secondary space with just a few folks working in the post-secondary space. And looking at the spread of who is here, it's important to celebrate, but I would be remiss if I did not also ask who was in the room with all of us these past two days? And who couldn't travel or who couldn't connect? And who might want to join all of us, whoever this company has encouraged? Now. Now, as I've moved amongst all of us these past few days, I begin to hear a few conversations. The first conversation, the first kind of theme that cut across much of what happened here, was a conversation about supporting students. That spoke loudly, whether people were talking about tools or talking about technology. The second conversation, that spoke throughout all of our activities was one around promoting openness and exploring the boundaries and the blended boundaries of open approaches to teaching and learning. And the third conversation that pervaded much of what we did together over the past few days was a conversation about fostering community and the various definitions of community, sometimes the context or the contested aspects of community, but fundamentally the importance of doing this work and doing it in community with others. And these are the three conversations I'd like to summarize and refract back to all of us right now. And so we'll begin with that first conversation about supporting students. Some of the resources and some of the comments about students were, of course, made on Twitter. I thought this was a wonderful visual representation about how students can be encouraged through video and great stuff with people being tagged and really interesting presentations of this information. We haven't seen this case track it down. It's pretty awesome. We've heard some folks uh, like 
uh, someone I put in front of a friend who had trust, who noted his thoughts on the student panel with Michael from yesterday. And the students who commented, it's important for online teachers to create opportunities for students to connect, bringing the student's voice into our conversations in this space and then amplifying them out via forums and also networks like Twitter. And thoughts about the future of what students will be learning and how we can best prepare them for that. Are kids going into the workforce with a sense of social justice? We can't forget their human element to all that we do. Now, this commitment to supporting students also emerged in many of the interpersonal conversations that I had with folks. I have quickly developed a very fond bond with Isaiah, someone I hope to call a friend, who learned at one point, you must promote equity of access for students generally. You must go back to the basics. And that to me speaks volumes to the importance that supporting students is fundamentally a commitment to equity in all the work that we do in that space. The wonderful gentleman who just raised me mentioned at one point, I recognize the value of brick and mortar schools, but I also recognize what is happening with John and Susie are in these online places. Recognizing the affordance of multiple kinds of learning settings and how that ultimately supports how schools engage in their learning. I've also had the honor of, of learning alongside for the past few months a gentleman who works in an area of actually my own research of game based learning and gamification. And at one point, Avi was talking about gamification and mentioned improved student engagement because that really means intellectual part. And I thought that was a rather provocative term when thinking about something like gamification. All of these comments of some of these students who have a core commitment. To support the students in whatever work happens in our DL space. Now, I saw a really interesting moment of this during a session on Thursday that was organized by the Ottawa Catholic School District. And the slide is a little dark, but that's intentional and important. Here's why the student on the screen is having a live conversation with the folks in the room. This is part of a live dive session. It was essentially a virtual school trip where the organizers of the session had scheduled a collaborative opportunity with their colleagues back at school and had worked with students who were literally being wheeled around the hallway in the classrooms of the school, talking with the attendees in the session about different aspects of learning and design. Now, when I saw this live dive, it emphasized the importance of connecting to students when we really care about them. But it's also about the thing that it's not only about connecting with students, but in this particular kind of moment, there's an interesting blurring of boundaries that's happening here, where youth and adult perspectives are blurred together on equal footing, and that rich conversations about learning and design can emerge from these kinds of spaces. But there was an interesting blending about expectations for what matters in a learning assignment or in the progression through something like a unit or even an entire year at a school. How is that socially negotiated between our students and our educators? There's also an interesting board of boundaries here in terms of youth and adult culture. And so technology can be a mediator that blends aspects of that culture together into a broader cultural learning. So as I saw this deep live dive, and as I thought about this broader conversation around supporting students, I've been thinking about a few questions that I hope are helpful for this community to carry forward. The first is, how do you continue to center students and their diverse and divergent voices in conversations about learning? And how does a student really become the center and the driving force of what we do and so what we talk about? I also am curious about the question how does the design of learning activities and learning technologies? Incorporate students' interests and their needs. 
when we design a new online module, or we adopt a new learning management system, or we want to create some kind of maker space or fab lab, is that a draw on and again centers in the interest in the learning I'm also curious how this community will continue to ask how do students take the lead in creating and ultimately sustaining school culture? The culture of a school is very much grown from the grassroots and is driven by students and their voices and their identities and fundamentally their hopes and their dreams. And rather than impose a school culture on our students, how do our students take the lead in designing and sustaining that culture? How does that show that we truly care for them? These are some of the questions I've thought about as I reflect upon this first conversation. On to the second conversation, a conversation about promoting openness, which is a term that is highly contested, often confusing, and here in the last few days, we see a directed interpretation on what it might mean to promote openness. So what are people saying about openness for some of the qualities of being a more open educator? Some folks are talking about a challenge that after an event like Tan that you learn and writing this new inspiring word of ideas and spreading all this excitement, that conversations that have to move to other colleagues. And how do we find open spaces back at our own schools or in our own communities? And how do we open up in those settings the kinds of conversations we've had in this setting? Another interpretation of openness was around the complexity of inquiry. Here is Tracy, if I'm not mistaken, who is reflecting kind of in the moment on a presentation that was yesterday that Zoe was putting on. She's talking about this openness to the complexity of looking at both the micro and the macro scale. And there's a both and tension here, and then perhaps we as educators need to be open to that complexity. Again, this theme of openness pervaded many of my personal conversations with folks. I had the pleasure of meeting for the first time Connie, who does quite a bit of work around open educational resources. And in one of her sessions, Connie mentioned that OER is really the sharing of content, and that then the new role of the teacher is facilitating knowledge production. And that's fundamentally positioned and also helps to amplify the importance of both open resources and how those are connected to open knowledge practices. Yet another interesting interpretation of open came from Mary, who I've not had a chance to look at a few times in the last nine months. And Mary was recalling to me one of her current learning experiences. She was actually participating in an online course around design thinking with some of my colleagues from the States. And she remarked to me, kind of offhand, in a very genuine way, it's good to be a learner again. It's really a home experience. And I thought, yeah, it is. And isn't it nice that we can all find ourselves in those learning again opportunities? And we can be humble knowing that we have the best to teach, but that anybody in that teaches always has some kind of boundary. Openness may also simply be an embrace of change. And Jen, who does some brilliant work around music education and health based education, was commenting upon how she uses both instruments and online resources to support student learning. And she kind of even mentioned, kind of just off the cuff, my blog and my homepage changes daily. I thought to myself, that's brilliant. The openness and the flexibility to the constant changing dynamic of content is just a part of everyday practice. And isn't that, isn't that a nice disposition towards a more agile vision of teaching? So these many interpretations of open, and this kind of expansive way we might interpret openness, I think can also be grounded in some of the concrete resources and some of the concrete opportunities that some folks have shared here. 
I found, for example, one resource, and this is from the United States, but it's from Rocky School, is that right? Really a nice way of, of for educators who are interested in either designing or adopting digital content, understanding aspects of accessibility, of design, and really trying to shape OER so that it really can be accessible for all. And this digital content checklist, which is Creative Commons license, was you can find online, and can certainly be adapted by anybody in this room, is a very concrete way of grounding some of these broader interpretations of what we might mean by open. Beyond the screen resources, there are also, of course, more sustained activities. And I had a chance to just scratch the surface and we learn a little bit more about the mold program. And it seems to me to be a really interesting model for how educators, driven by interest, can come together and learn about certain practices in a highly supported network in a very creative way. And I know that there are folks here, again, including Connie, who can speak about this certainly better than I can. But at first glance, I said to myself, wow, if I was really curious about being more invested in the work of open, this might be a more sustainable opportunity that I could easily jump right into. Given though some of the critical and almost let's say social justice oriented conversations that have occurred at this conference as well, I think it's also important to be open to perspectives that are contrary to ours. And the resource that I found that perhaps does this in a very provocative way and really challenges us to look at history and culture and identity in a way that goes far beyond personal biases and blind spots is the Voices into Action curriculum materials. And if you haven't had a chance to stop by our table, please do so. I picked up some of the material and really I think speaks to a very different interpretation of open that we used to look at traditions of critical education and again, more social justice oriented approaches that can really become the foundation for how we choose to design our learning, particularly in the digital world. So as I look at these resources and I listen to these conversations about promoting openness, Here's what I'm asking myself now. What supports cultivate open resources, open practices, and an open learning architecture? And I think the idea of supports and creating the conditions for that work, many people spoke to. As they spoke about that, it reminds me that the work we do has both technical affordances, many of which we love to geek out on, many of which we want to perhaps design ourselves, but that those learning architectures are fundamentally social. And then we must think about these social supports as much as the technical when we need to design or architect our new learning environments. I'm also asking myself the question, how does shared language, yet divergent meaning, promote open innovation? There's been a lot of conversation here about the fact that many of us are in the DL space, but we're also just in the L space. We really ultimately just care about learning. And we also share many other words in common, like content and community. And yet, there are often divergent interpretations of those words, which may in fact help us to spark innovative change. They can then, of course, be shared with others. So how does that happen? I'm also asking myself, how does this field of education that we're all in, that we all call home, how does it lead to the opening of more equitable learning futures? There was an interesting tension, perhaps, a rather conversation yesterday around this very fast-paced rate of change in technology. We can look back 5, 10, 30 years to the computers that we use then, to the devices that we use today, and recognize how quickly technology changes. And yet, it seems like the conversation is presumed that the field of education is always playing catch up. And we had a short exchange via Twitter about the fact that perhaps rather for a more ethical approach to what we can do, maybe it's a field of education that should be more to define the terms of more ethical and equitable learning. 
And I don't know what Tracy is, you know, I wish she had more for the ministry, but we had a nice exchange around this idea of ethical technology leadership that follows the real need of the field of education. And being open to that perspective may help to create more equitable learning futures. So the third conversation, and one that I think brought all of us here, and I hope will bring all of you back. And that's on fostering community. Community was similar, of course, and as folks shared online, they noted, hey, thanks for coming out. Thanks to those who attended my session on engaging students. Great conversation. Here are my session why. What a nice way of acknowledgement and extending the conversation to resource sharing. And I hope if you were facilitating a session over the last three days, maybe you've done something just like this. Share out your slide, share out a link to that, show the Google Doc, and help continue the conversation that's fostering the sense of connecting. Someone also was like the most body and body is going to be great to connect. Another great day at Canyon Yard, we have some very hardworking, talented teachers and partners in the and that appreciation for what this professional community needs is important. Recognizing and honoring that this is a meaningful opportunity is important and not to be taken for granted. This sense of fostering community also came through in some of my conversations with folks and some of the things I talk about. Zoe has given a variety of presentations here on making and indigenous perspectives in aspects of inquiry. Talked about the inquiry of the classroom is being about creating conditions for human centric education. And nothing more than human centric education, in my opinion, speaks to the need to foster community. All of the innovation and technical wizardry may take us not very far down the road. If a human centric approach rooted in community is not the foundation upon which that innovation takes root. And my dear friend, and I call him the mentor now, Jet, mentioned at one point, we must have a social negotiation of the learning contract. And that idea of socially negotiating a shared endeavor speaks to the kind of mutual respect that must kind of again serve as a kind of shared language in a kind of community that works together. So what does that look like here? In one of the, the workshops, which I was able to facilitate and learn quite a bit from since I was really deep in that space for a Sunday afternoon, we were talking about design thinking, and I had folks run through a very rapid uh, design thinking cycle. And it might be a little hard to see in this photograph, but the poster being held up was a response, a visualization to the question, what are the better ways to blend learning across boundaries? And this team's final visualization asks this question at its center, how to make hearts connections? And I thought that was so provocative that as we think about increasing the efficacy around blending learning and the deal work that everyone does, it ultimately came down to a question of heart and heart connections. So how do we do this? How do we make heart connections with our colleagues? But not only that, with of course our students and our families and the communities that we're all in And we can of course share our stories and listen to one another deeply. And as we share our stories, it often becomes more comfortable that we share some of our struggles and those persistent problems of practice that really give us meaning, but keep us scratching our heads. And ultimately, as we share stories and struggles, we begin to see solutions emerge, perhaps solutions to questions like, what are better ways to blend learning? This is to me the social component of the kind of foster community that keeps folks here moving face to face and sharing with so you. And of course, there's a technical component. Blogging 
perhaps is part of the backlog. If you have a blog in this room, please raise your hand. There are some brilliant blogs out there. Not quite half of the folks in here. And my hope is that a year from now, if someone asks you that same question, more folks will raise their hand. Blogging becomes a way of creating an online community where one can share their knowledge, receive feedback, kind of present rough draft thinking that then becomes the seed for greater change. And if you are one of the people who has a blog, I hope that before this keynote is over, you've gotten on Twitter and you just tweet out the URL of your blog and tag it with our conference hashtag so that everybody can access your thinking, your perspectives. And when you all do that, you begin to create a network. It's a knowledge network. It's an open network. It has an architecture that perhaps comes via Twitter or WordPress, but whatever it is, it's a network learning community. And you can create that with each other as you begin to deepen your learning practice. Ultimately, as networks get active, one of the things that I hope to see in many professional learning communities, this and others, is that additional attention is put towards the archives. That we find ways of curating resources that are easily accessible, where our metadata can be easily attached, and where all kinds of newcomers and those old time experts can easily find information that helps to transform teaching learning practices. This then is the technological architecture that complements the social that helps to foster community. And when that happens, I believe it then raises the next questions. How does listening to and honoring stories from one another help to foster our learning communities? Ultimately, if we share information, about a new technology, it's often a story about a person. And I walked into so many sessions in the last few days, whether it was sessions about gamification platforms, or it was sessions about new learning management systems, that ultimately began with stories about people. And it's those stories that help us to foster our learning communities. I'm also curious, how will we shape these new and emerging technologies to cement rather than to segregate our learning community? This is a healthy tension, and yet one that can have, perhaps unfortunately, a bit of a dark side as new technologies emerge, questions of authorship, questions of safety, questions of identity are always at the surface, as are questions about intellectual property. And then the expertise in this room and our responsibility as educators, I think, compels us to share how we know that new and emerging technologies can actually cement community and not further fracture community. These have been the conversations that were happening over the last few days as we gathered here at our symposium. They were conversations with our students. There were conversations about openness, and there were conversations about community. And these ultimately are, of course, nodes in a more networked conversation. And a conversation that not only occurs at the individual level, or at the level of an event like this, but it's also reflective of longer-term conversations, as well as efforts to bring these kinds of conversations into a more actionable approach to the design of our work. In some respects, these conversations reflect core competencies around communication and critical and creative thinking. And these various dimensions of personal and social identity and social responsibility that again are very much the root from which much of our work grows. And then from these conversations and competencies, we can recognize then a shared desire to move forward and to move forward from conversation and competency, perhaps 
to get a more shared understanding of empathy, purpose, and action. And I emphasize empathy given the complexity of setting and culture, students and families who we work with every day. The shared purpose of knowing that the work that you're all doing is incredibly hard, but always honorable, and that action ultimately is our calling. And that we move our conversation to this place together. And ultimately, that happens with a few more provocative questions and observations. So I'll begin to leave you with these concluding thoughts, not from me, but from others, as a means of illustrating the importance of growing this network, growing these thoughts, connecting opportunities of empathy, purpose, and action, and moving the work of learning forward. Ultimately, why are we doing the work? And what are the implications for our practice? The question of why, which is mentioned this morning, and is often the foundation for what we'll do together. That question of why helps to grow and expand our networks of knowledge and our networks of truth just a little bit. From days, we know that idea of giving up tools, of actually giving up some of what might be comfortable with, with any single computer. It's something we all battle with when it comes to digital literacy as a learner ourselves. And then as a learner, we simply have to give up the tools or the practices or dispositions that we take for granted in order to wrestle with new ideas and problems and challenges. And when we do that, our perspectives and our networks grow just a little bit more. They continue to expand and connect us to new people and ideas. And finally, perhaps most provocatively, from Atlanta, maybe school is going to complete overall. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> and perhaps that vision takes us to the furthest edges of our network and our knowledge. Ultimately, a network that should look familiar to everyone in this world. I know that I hope to sustain you as you move forward. Thank you very much. <laughs>